Hi, this is Tony Sagami. Hey, I want to talk to you about some new numbers that just came out of China. Uh, they just reported the, uh, the consumer price index numbers for the month of January, and there was a, quite a bit of information in there. Now, the headline number was that the consumer prices increased by 4.9% in January. Uh, that was slightly below expectations. But I tell you, once you're approaching 5%, uh, 5% that's a pretty high rate of annualized inflation. However, uh, most of the Wall Street crowd took that to be a good number because slightly below expectations. And if you back out food and energy, uh, the inflation of all the other goods only increased by 2.6%, a very manageable number. Now, there's other couple details in there, the devilish details, that tell a very different story. First of all, the PPI, or the Wholesale Producer Price Index, was up by 6.6% .6 in January. Now, usually the PPI leads the CPI, and that tells me that there's some inflationary pressures building in wholesale prices, which are largely driven by higher wages and even higher commodity prices. Another statistic that really caught my attention was that housing prices over the last 12 months have increased by 6.8%. You know, 7% is a pretty healthy annual jump, but it's really a surprise given that China's tried so hard to cool down real estate speculation by raising the reserve requirements six times since the beginning of 2010 and raising interest rates three times since October. Now, the biggest volcano lurking behind those numbers was the news that food had increased by 10.3% on an annualized basis. That is a big jump. And that's really a problem because uh, for all emerging markets, its citizens spend a very high portion uh, of its income on food. You know, if uh, our food prices jump 10% for you and I, you know, perhaps we uh, don't go to a movie or don't buy the new Blackberry, the new iPod. But in China and other emerging markets, when food prices jump dramatically, it's not a matter of them cutting back on, on other uh, discretionary items. It's a matter of them going hungry or eating food that's really much lower in quality and nutrition. Now, like I said, China has raised interest rates three times since October and reserved the reserve, reserve requirements six times. But this inflation data tells me that there's even more tightening on the way in China. Uh, let me give you another factoid that caught my attention. That's very closely related. Uh, for the second month in a row, uh, the Chinese government has been a net seller of U.S. Treasury bonds. Now, for December, which is the most latest statistic, China sold $4 billion worth of U.S. bonds in December and now holds $891 billion worth of U.S. Treasury bonds. Now, $4 billion may not sound like a lot out of $891 billion, but you also have to keep that in context over the 20 plus billion per month that China gets from us because of our trade deficit. And so what that means is instead of selling $4 billion of bonds, it's really more like they sold 20 to 24. Now, additionally, this is the second month in a row that China has been a net seller of treasury bonds. They sold $11 billion in the month of December. So what's this all mean? I think three things. First of all, it means don't hold dollars. Uh, the Chinese are pretty smart. They don't want to hold dollars because they think they're going down, and I agree with them. Number two, if you're a, a fixed income investor, you need to keep your maturities very short as inflation continues to pick up. If you own long-term bonds, I think you're going to get clobbered. And lastly, number three, you need to overweight your portfolio with stocks that profit from rising interest rates. Now, if you want to see the type of stocks I'm recommending to profit from this environment, go to asiastockalert.com, uh, and if you subscribe to it, you'll be able to find out what my top picks are. Until next week, this is Tony Sigami signing off.